Hello, everyone. Welcome to Cube Day. Uh, <coughs> I am uh, Ashik, and I lead the internal compute team uh, at Cloudera. Hello, everyone. Are you able to be ideable? OK. Hello, everyone. I am CB. I am a staff engineer at Cloudera, uh, working on uh, container uh, compute cloud. What do you, Ashik? OK. So we can all agree that we live in a container era, right? Everything is moving into microservices or almost all already has moved, and containers are at the heart of it. <coughs> And even Cloudera transformed, right? <coughs> OK, so why uh, containers work for Cloudera? As you can see, our product moved from a monolithic architecture to modular, adopting uh, microservices. And containers were the de facto choice. The compute platform, which provides infra for all the product development, testing, and release certifications, also followed course. And it simplified a lot of things for us, right, in terms of operations and all those. We saw better hardware utilization because of the less uh, overhead. Uh, we saw optimized software packaging due to uh, image layer reuse. Dev self-service improved because they had more uh, uh, control over the runtime environment. We also moved out of the depend uh, dependency management uh, cycle. <coughs> so now let's take a look at the container cloud that I was talking about. At Cloudera, we use Apache YAN uh, for resource management and scheduling. And Docker was the uh, uh, container runtime. We provide uh, VM-like containers uh, to uh, engineers. Uh, we have a routable IP and a DNS name with SSH access and external connectivity. Uh, today, this platform is a core part of our product development uh, and testing and is almost adopted by most of the products across uh, uh, the company. Let's uh, take a look at a few numbers uh, for reference. Uh, Capacity-wise, we have around 7, 000, uh, 700 uh, bare metals, uh, which give us around 220 TB of memory and 27,000 cores. And in terms of scale, at any given day, we will see around 2,000 clusters running uh, with around uh, you know, uh, over 8,000 plus uh, containers with an average uh, memory usage of 80%. Per 80 and during peak release cycles, we uh, also reach around 95% of average memory usage with uh, around 3,000 plus clusters running. So just like Cloudera, the container era brought a massive shift from VMs to containers. Right? So does this mean that virtual machines are going to die off and become a relic? <coughs> so these are uh, search volumes for VMs and containers from Google Trends. And we can see that from 2013-14, we have a steady growth in container adoption <coughs> and its effect on the VM popularity. <coughs> so the interesting fact is that even after eight years of container adoption, we see that there is still considerable uh, amount of workloads that run on VMs, and they have not. And why is it, right? Why did uh, VMs not flatline in a container era? One is isolation. So any workload that needs strong uh, uh, environment uh, and network isolation tend to choose VMs. The flexibility with the OS kernel, and especially you know, in terms where, uh, in places where they have to tweak the uh, non-namespaced kernel parameters, etc. VMs are the go-to choices. Simplicity in terms of networking and storage is another strong uh, feature of uh, VMs, and uh, it <coughs> that's when uh, and 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 we can see that why VMs you know uh, are still a crucial part and cannot be discarded as such even in the container era. <coughs> in in our container cloud, we didn't we didn't support VMs, right? And the VM use cases were rising. For example, the last one that we had was around uh, uh, FIPS enabled kernel for FedRAMP. Let's look at a few other things, uh, the gaps that we had in our container cloud. We didn't have persistent volume support for stateless application. Uh, similarly, for uh, you know, the same ephem ephemeral storage uh, was uh, hindering our host maintenance, and it was uh, making it very difficult uh, and time consuming, both for uh, users and us. Uh, Apache YAN, by design, uh, deploys an uh, application manager for each cluster. Uh, although it, is only, uh, it, it consumes only a couple of GBs, at our scale, it used to come in order of uh, TBs. And last, uh, most of our control plane components were going EOL. And in case of any Docker upgrades or uh, you know, kernel version upgrades, there were a lot of incompatibilities and things which we had to hack around. So with all this, we started our pursuit to find that silo bullet, which would solve all these issues for us. And <coughs> that is where Kubernetes came into picture. Kubernetes showed promise, and uh, you know it kind of covered all uh, the basic aspects for us. It gave us uh, good uh, uh, performance in, base, uh, in terms of resource management. Uh, <coughs> it could run at scale. It was highly available. It had uh, support for containers by default. 
Qbert gave uh, support for VMs, uh, persistent uh, workload support for stateful uh, applications, loads and loads of plugins and con controllers from choose from, and an exponentially growing community. But it did come with challenges for us in terms of our use cases. The major one was network. We want, uh, for our use cases, need a stable IP address and uh, external, with external connectivity and SSH access. <coughs> and DNS. So we also need a stable name resolution for pods because users have to SSH and you know, uh, need connectivity to the VMs and containers. Uh, Cube secondary DNS uh, comes, with, uh, comes by default with Qbert, but only handles for VMs. So what to do with pods? That was an open question. Qbert uses something called data volumes for provisioning the root volume from uh, image disks. Uh, we found that it is uh, slow, and uh, uh, our pre-warmed images are around uh, 15, 20 GB, and uh, it was uh, considerably slow for us. Uh, live migration support, the Qbert VMs again supported live migration eviction policy, but there was nothing you know, clear in terms of how to make it work with uh, zero downtime. And multi-tenancy, this is one of the critical things. Uh, Apache Yarn uh, helped us uh, you know, uh, manage complex uh, hierarchical uh, quota management, and we needed something that uh, you know, would do the same for us in Kubernetes. <clears throat> and this is where our journey gets uh, more interesting. And CB will now walk you through all the uh, innovations and uh, the workarounds that we did to get this working and migrate our production environment. Thank you. Thank you, Hasi. Green one. So we will now discuss how we address our uh, uh, platform and revamped and uh, innovated by introducing, addressing the challenges. So this is a high-level architecture, and we use a vanilla Kubernetes uh, flavor, and that comes with the uh, default uh, control planes. And on top of that uh, default vanilla Kubernetes cluster, we introduce a Qbot HCO and then Apache Unicorn. And uh, this Qbot HCO is uh, allows us to run the VM workloads and uh, keep to uh, stay the VM as a first-class citizen on the cluster. And Apache Unicorn is the powerful uh, resource scheduler for managing the resources of uh, VM and uh, pods in the cluster. On top of that, we have a Cloudera infra control plane uh, that includes provisioning API. That is a layer where a user interacts with our cluster to provision the VM and uh, Pods. And we have a quota manager, and uh, that is our uh, uh, Cloudera uh, CDP part of product, and that takes care of uh, providing the hierarchical based uh, uh, quota structure. And the DNS manager, it's a, a controller to uh, manage the DNS for pods and VMs. And there is a workflow manager, and uh, we uh, built that over using the Stack Storm as a default workflow manager. And this is the high-level picture of uh, how the VM and pod works together in that uh, default Kubernetes architecture. So network uh, uh, architecture, external connect connectivity is the main uh, uh, deal breaker for us, because uh, by default, uh, when you create a VM and pod, that will uh, default attach to the Kubernetes internal uh, network. And uh, to address that uh, problem, we uh, introduce multiple uh, CNIs part of this uh, network uh, stack. The first thing is the uh, Multus CNI. That is a CNI which takes care of um, uh, attaching the secondary interface on the pods and VMs. And uh, there is a bridge interface that is configured in all the nodes to connect all the Multus CNI interface to that uh, bridge. And there is a uh, whereabout CNI that takes care of IP address management uh, for pods and VMs. It always ensures to provide the unique IP address for that uh, requester resource. So DNS architecture, Qbert recommends to use the Kube secondary DNS for uh, managing the DNS uh, name for uh, VMs. But it doesn't have uh, support for creating the DNS record for pods. So that is how the challenge is addressed. So we patch the upstream uh, Kube secondary DNS by forking that, um, uh, the open source uh, Kube secondary DNS repo. And uh, we added the pod support. And uh, by default, it comes with the VMA controller. That is the one uh, coordinates whenever there is a VM request comes and creates the DNS record. And at the same time, the pod controller watch for the new pod creation, and uh, it creates that uh, records 
in the zone file. That is a persistent volume in the cluster. And uh, between that, there is a zone manager which coordinates between the core DNS. And the core DNS will uh, auto reload when and there there is a changes to the records. So provisioning time. So by default, when you use the Qbert recommended the provisioning uh, way, it uses the data volume to import that uh, image into the PVC. So for uh, creating the uh, few MBs, for example, uh, 1 to 10 uh, megabits of uh, image, it would take uh, uh, more than uh, uh, five minutes. To address that, we use the, uh, the backing image support provided within the Longhorn. And uh, that uh, allows us to create the storage class based on the uh, OS image we request for. And then there, is, there will be a PV attached to that uh, storage class. And ultimately, the provisioning takes only a few seconds to provision the entire uh, VM. So live migration. So uh, ultimately, uh, having the perfect live migration use case, it's better for the stateful applications. So we. Uh, configure the eviction strategy in the live migration manifest. And uh, that uh, interacts with the uh, persistent root disk. And also, that is configured with the uh, RWX mode in the VM side so that uh, the live migration can happen between across the nodes. And the future side, we are still exploring on how we can provide the dedicated network for uh, segmenting the data traffic and optimizing the transmission of uh, doing the live migration. So quota management, so having the uh, cluster with uh, managing both uh, VM and pods, it should have the proper uh, resource management. So for that, uh, we, we are using the Cloudera's uh, CDP product that takes care of uh, provi providing the efficient quota manager and the Apache Unicorn for uh, resource scheduling. So quota manager, it is, uh, takes care of providing the API for a hierarchical quota. And Apache Unicorn is the powerful uh, uh, resource scheduler that uh, provides the quota enforcement and preempts and, and priority and access controllers and more. Yeah, this quota manager and Unicorn both uh, interact together for form the efficient uh, quota. And our migration journey uh, started towards uh, migrating into this uh, uh, Qbert uh, based uh, uh, platform. And uh, probably we'll uh, come up with the next uh, talk, how about uh, we fit with the size and scale and performance numbers. We would like to thank our open source communities. Uh, these are all our key pillars to form this cluster. And uh, uh, without them, we will not be able to build this uh, cluster for combination of VM and ports. Yeah, thank you everyone. Thank you. Thank you guys. <laughs>